effort, it, it was very well. Hello and welcome to this Euractiv hybrid conference with the support of the Embassy of the Republic of Kazakhstan to the Kingdom of Belgium. Today we will be discussing Kazakhstan in 2022, um, a seismic year of change and unprecedented regional geopolitics. I'm Charles Shumsky, I'm a journalist here at Euractiv and I will be moderating this panel um, as we look at the implications of the Kazakh elections and what is coming up next for the country and the region. 2022 is arguably the most eventful year in the history of Kazakhstan since it gained its independence. Um, the tragic turmoil of early January 2022 led to extensive changes in the Kazakh government and society. President Tokayev um, proposed a series of reforms aimed at building what he has termed as New Kazakhstan, or Just and Fair Kazakhstan, which included amendments to the country's laws, including the constitution, which were approved by a nationwide referendum held on the 5th of June. Um, one of these amendments was about limiting the presidential mandate to a single term of seven years, which is a political practice so far unknown in Central Asia. Um, seeking democratic, democratic con confirmation in September, President Tokayev announced um, new um, presidential elections, which took place on November the 20th, and he has been largely re-elected with 81%, um, which confirmed his mandate until the parliamentary elections of um, the first half of 2023, which are yet to come. Now, as we said, Kazakhstan has been through a lot in 2022. We've seen the riots in January, constitutional reforms, uh, the past elections, and all of this with the Russian war in Ukraine in the background and the destabilizing effects um, it has had worldwide. <coughs> with all that in mind, where is Kazakhstan headed? Which challenges does it face today after this year? And what can it mean for the region, for Central Asia? Uh, these are the questions that our experts are going to help us answer during this discussion. To join the discussion, you can submit your questions to our panelists. Um, for the people here in the room or online, you can uh, use the Slido app um, to send your questions. Please note that any question on the Slido needs to be in English. Please also indicate the speaker to whom your question is addressed. Now, joining us today, br very briefly, we have on uh, my left uh, Dietmar Chrysler, who is the head of Division Central Asia for of the European External Action Service. 
we have Iskander um, Akilbaev, the director for Central Asia at Oxford Policy Advisory Group. We have joining us Alberto Turkstra, a project manager at Diplomatic World. To his left, we have um, Andrei Chibatarev, director of Alternative Center for Current Research in Almaty, Kazakhstan. And we have finally Dr. Muhit Ardager Siddik Nazarov, uh, director of the Institute of Modern Political Studies at the Gumilyov Eurasian National University of Kazakhstan. Welcome uh, to all our panelists. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm going to ask you your introductory statement. So each of you is going to have approximately one minute for your int introductory statement. Mr. Chrysler, you're up. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I, in one minute, I could say um, that Central Asia is back in the, uh, on, the, on the agenda, political agenda of the European Union um, with Russian's aggression against, um, against Ukraine. This region has become um, important, almost strategic for the European Union. Um, a country like Kazakhstan, with its um, political weight, with its economic weight, uh, in that region is uh, is therefore an important country that we talk to, that we reach out to, and um, and those um, this importance has been underlined recently when President Michel travelled to the region. Uh, at the end of October, he met with the um, five um, leaders of Central Asia. And just recently, uh, on the 17th of uh, November, we all went to, um, to Samarkand in Uzbekistan for the EU-Central Asia Connectivity Conference. And all this underlines, I think, uh, that there is a, um, an increased um, uh, focus uh, of EU foreign policy uh, for that region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Ekelbaev, your... Yeah, well, thank you very much once again for organizers. Uh, I believe for not only for Kazakhstan, 2022 has been unprecedented year of changes and geopolitical turmoils. The supply chains and the uh, uh, food security, energy security has been dramatically under trans transformation. For Kazakhstan, certainly 2022 has been uh, a year of uh, great transformation in, within itself, within the domestic politics, within the foreign policy. We see uh, demands from the society has been increasing uh, day by day. Uh, people are, uh, has changed the values and the vision for the future of Kazakhstan has been, has been on the rise. From the one hand, uh, Kazakh government is trying to uh, apply new changes, which uh, 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 on the terms of the uh, the expectations of the Kazakh society. At the same time, we see unprecedented level of uh, external shocks. Uh, the situation which is happening in Ukraine, the military activity, uh, which is quite near to the Kazakhstan. At, at the same time, the Central Asian region in, within itself is changing very fast. We just recently had an elections. We are expecting parliamentary elections uh, next year. Uh, so it's a, it's a great. Uh, uh, change uh, within the region and in Kazakhstan. So we hope to understand the situation better, to make up, uh, to do uh, better choices. Thank you very much. Mr. Tokstra? Yes. Let me start by saying that these pres early presidential elections uh, bring to an end uh, the most eventful and turbulent year uh, Kazakhstan has faced in its 30 years uh, of independence. And while the outcome uh, may have been somewhat predictable, most notable is that the elections took place uh, peacefully, something that seemed far from certain a few months ago in the aftermath of the tragic January events. Now, the decision to call for early elections reflects the tremendous challenges that Kazakhstan faces, both internal and external, and we'll discuss more about it later. And the early elections also meant to maintain the momentum from the constitutional refer referendum held in June, uh, where 77% of the voters voted in favor of comprehensive amendments to the constitution, as the moderator mentioned. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Andrei, if you want to go for your... ...о uh, мирном uh, переходе сейчас uh, um, к новому мандату. Uh, естественно, мы можем подчеркнуть важных новых вызовов для Казахстана. Мы так. также... Um, да. Можем uh, говорить. говорить о том, что... Коллеги, секунду, пожалуйста, у, у переводчика uh, опоздание аудиосигнала, поэтому... Uh, есть опоздание в 15-20 секунд. Господин Чеботарев, пожалуйста, вам... Добрый день. Казахстан в текущем году пережил три таких мощных 
политическом отношении события. Первое, это, конечно, январские события или январские процессы, когда гражданский политический протест против отдельных решений в экономике привел к массовым таким выступлениям антиправительственного характера, где действительно гражданские протесты смешались с попытками государственного переворота. И это до сих пор отражается в казахстанском политической жизни, но оно дало, скажем, старт второму важному событию, это проведение масштабной конституционной реформы путем проведения республиканского референдума. Для нас это очень знаковое событие. Почему? Потому что республиканский референдум последний раз прошел в августе 1995 года, когда была принята действующая конституция, больше не проводился. И теперь его вернули фактически в политический процесс. А сама конституционная реформа прошла под флагом возвращения в избирательный процесс элементов мажоритарной системы, возвращения конституционного суда. И, наконец, третье важное событие – это досрочные президентские выборы, которые прошли 20 ноября текущего года и задали новую политическую повестку уже на краткосрочную, среднесрочную перспективу, но об этом мы можем поговорить отдельно. Не забываем про последовательный перевод. Два-три предложения, ни на что не успеет перевести. Король, кстати, когда сейчас шел перевод, было слышно, было, наоборот, хорошо для аудитории. Мы видим да, окончание перевода. Okay, well, now, uh, thank you for your first, uh, for your uh, introductory statement. I'm going to ask Mr. Siddiq Nazarov your introductory statement, please. Uh -huh. uh, всех приветствую uh, со стороны. Uh, так как тема моего выступления является uh, сегодня Центральная Азия, то я хотел бы выразить uh, вступительное слово буквально в двух-трех предложениях. В Центральной Азии еще не интеграция, но уже кооперация. Это первое. И Центральная Азия после смены политических лидеров, как минимум в трех, в четырех государствах, сейчас в периоде активной трансформации. Вот коротко и ясно. Такая позиция. Thank you very much. I think we're still waiting for the translation. Okay, we, because of technical issues, we're just going to continue. Repeat it. We're just going to continue for, for the time being. Thank you very much. Well, let's then delve directly into it. Um, I would like to start talking about the fact that the international observers have been very positive about how the election process was handled on election day. And this is what Mr. Tokstra, you, you just said, uh, with no interference in the monitoring, um, in the monitoring of the poll stations, with um, no hindrance as to where they could, the observers could go. However, the OSCE has been quite critical of the elections, especially the lack of political pluralism um, for the last elections. Could you care to tell more about this, please? Yes, indeed. I have, I've read this OSCE ODHR statement of the preliminary findings, uh, where it says the, about the lack of competitiveness <coughs> and the lack of uh, political pluralism. Uh, the report also states that the incumbent did not face uh, any significant opposition and that no contestant meaningfully challenged or spoke critically about the president's policies uh, limiting the choice for voters. Now, on this part of the OSC report, I, I disagree. Um, during our visit to Astana, we had the opportunity to speak, for instance, with one of the presidential candidates, one of the two female candidates participating, Ms. Saltana Tursimbekova. And while at first sight her election program does indeed not differ much 
much from that of President Tokayev with an emphasis on the the monopolization judicial reform, uh, more competitive environment in the political sphere. She also openly spoke about a number of systemic problems facing Kazakhstan that have not been tackled at the highest political level. This is the difficult economic situation of single mothers, of people with disabilities and the issue of domestic violence. Um, so she proposes new legislation in this field to combat uh, violence, to lower the retirement age of women, uh, to increasing the minimum wage and writing off uh, debt of large families, for instance. And she also mentioned to us that the current 30% quota for women and young people in the voting list of political parties uh, was not ambitious enough. So we do see that there is a certain debate on certain issues, even if there is no active opposition to the, to the incumbent. But we see an active uh, dialogue taking place, which was unthinkable five or ten years ago in Kazakhstan. Okay, so you're saying there is progress in that matter? There is progress. Timid, but progress. Timid, okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to hear maybe what Mr. Akil Bayev um, has to say on the on the matter of maybe the, the criticism of the OSCE, the lack of opposition for the elections. Well, uh, I uh, fully, certainly, the OSCE has its own opinion and it, it can be uh, legitimate or partially legitimate. It's not up to me to kind of describe whether they are right or wrong. But from what I see is that society in Kazakhstan has uh, very much been politicized specifically after January events. So uh, in the mass media, so you see that the battle of different opinions, specifically in telegram channels, mm -hmm. in the social media and social network, there are different alternative opinions on that. So at least uh, we, s we don't see the monopoly of the state television channels, how to produce uh, kind of the, the real news or the, the true news, etc. So I, I think that uh, even if there is a criticism, it's a, it's a normal process and it's a, okay, it should be accepted in this respect. So th because 25% uh, of Kazakh society and uh, population is a young generation. So in this respect, uh, so it's uh, almost 5 million people and they were born after their independence. And certainly they, cons they are the main consumers of this uh, social and economic political contact, content. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Krisla, ID on the... I would think that um, these... Um, Short, shortcomings uh, should be taken by the authorities uh, in, a, mm -hmm. in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. they should, um, I would expect them to look at them, um, to, to see what can be improved, um, because I really believe that the upcoming parliamentary elections in, uh, in the first half of next year, they are a, a very, very important opportunity for Kazakhstan to, to really demonstrate its clear will to embark on a, on a new model of governance. Um, uh, this is the, the ambition uh, of President Tokayev um, it, uh, uh, with, a, with a very credible um, uh, election process um, according to, the, to international standards. I think uh, the reform process that the President is, uh, is driving uh, will, become, um, will become much more of a reality and, and I think this is very important. Thank you very much. Stage. Um, just to come back on what you just said about the reforms and the importance of implementing them. Um, Mr. Tokstra, um, what do you think we should expect from uh, Mr. Tokayev's new mandate? Yeah. Um, what is, in terms of reforms, where are we at and what is it that we can actually expect from uh, this? Well, looking at uh, <coughs> his new mandate, I think the main goal of, of President Tokayev, uh, uh, the political reforms will be not so much to facilitate the rise of uh, political alternatives, but rather on improving the performance and efficiency of the public administration and to make it more responsive to the demands and the needs of the population, especially the socio-economic grievances that led to the peaceful protest uh, in January in the first place. And I think for this purpose, the new government will likely be made up of younger reform-minded technocrats, which is part of his wider push to rejuvenate the country's uh, public service to push through uh, this agenda. Um, on the economic front, uh, I think there's been a very sensible diagnosis by President Tokayev on the challenges facing Kazakhstan and that were for a long time holding back the potential of the country. This is the overbearing presence of the state in the economy, price regulation, monopolies, uh, lack of capital market development and corruption. And as such, the oligarchizing and demonopolizing the Kazakh economy will require very bold action, uh, ambitious market reform program and confronting powerful and vested economic interests in the economy and rent-seeking behaviors. So this is what I see in the next uh, few months and years. Thank you. 
um, just to um, communicate that we have some issues with the with the translation right now. So I'm just going to focus on some panelists. The time that it's uh, being uh, it's being uh, solved. У нас еще проблемы с переводом, так что я буду сосредоточиться на некоторых э, наших гостей, а потом верну, вернемся к вам. А, я могу просто добавить, что говорил ну, господин Тарст в качестве этого э, рефлексии. У нас нет, а, нет, а, нет? У нас нет перевода пока а, на английский. Так что а, вернемся к вам. Okay. Спасибо. Maybe a word, uh, Mr. Akilbaev, on uh, the reforms, the hopes that are... Uh, well, uh, the hopes and the reforms are like out, uh, in the air mm -hmm. uh, in Kazakhstan, and uh, uh, they are quite legitimate. So if you are uh, looking at the, the social economic sphere, you see that, uh, as President Tokayev has addressed uh, in a previous <coughs> statement, that there is certain the dis distribution of wealth in the monopoly of, uh, of, of a main economic sector in Kazakhstan was not well designed in this respect. And certainly now is a process of uh, kind of restructuring the, the main sectors of economy. Uh, that's why I think diversification of, of the like energy sector mm. is very much important. And that's why if you take into account the, 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 the war which is happening in Ukraine and the, the, the changes uh, of the supply chain and that our economy is certainly the kind of 80% goes through the Russia, the gas pipeline, oil pipelines. We certainly are uh, interested in kind of improving the economic context, not only in the domestic level, but also on the international level, because it's uh, uh, our uh, economic sustainability. And that's why we're looking for different roads, like mill corridor, uh, working through the Caspian Sea with our partners in uh, Azerbaijan or Georgia, etc. So we are looking uh, how to improve our connections and roads. And that's why European Union is very much important. And 70% of European Union investments to Central Asia goes through Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. so. I could only agree. Um, uh, I think uh, Kazakhstan has um, the potential to, to, to develop further its uh, economic relationship with the European Union. Uh, it has a, a very uh, important um, uh, location there uh, on the axis between East and West, um, between China and Europe, uh, hence also the interest of the European Union to um, cooperate closely with Kazakhstan on improving connectivity options. Um, the northern corridor through Russia has become difficult, uh, impossible uh, for, for Kazakhstan, uh, also for, for the other Central Asian countries. Uh, hence the need really to discuss alternative trade corridors, trade routes. Uh, that was very much an issue um, at the uh, EU Central Asia Connectivity Conference 10 days ago mm -hmm. in uh, Samarkand. Um, and the European Commission is also um, has has actually um, is paying for a, a study that is conducted by the <coughs> European Union for Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD, and uh, and that study is precisely looking at those aspects: what are alter alternative uh, trade corridors uh, between Central Asia and um, and Europe? And it's not only the middle corridor, which is a very sort of uh, Kazakh-focused uh, uh, issue. Uh, it's also looking at, at, uh, at other options. Um, and uh, we, we do expect those, um, those, the results of that study to, be, uh, to, to come out in about uh, six months' time. And then on that basis, I think we were much more uh, able to discuss more concretely uh, what alternative trade corridors and routes uh, between Central Asia and Europe should be developed and how they can be developed, what, what the real needs are uh, in this regard. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, another maybe uh, question for you is uh, you, you've mentioned um, several um, several projects, several connectivity projects that we have with Kazakhstan. Is it the reason why we ha we've signed a memorandum of understanding uh, the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh uh, for uh, energy? Actually, um, it's on critical raw materials. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a memorandum of understanding between the European Union and Kazakhstan on critical raw materials. Uh, it's a, it's a more a declaration of intentions mm -hmm. from both sides to develop better uh, the discussion and the dialogue on, on these critical raw materials. Um, but it also would enable um, to, uh, for European investors uh, to have a, a better and a more privileged access to, uh, to the Kazakh uh, market. So I do believe it's, uh, it's in the interest of both parties, and I would even hope that this would serve as an example for other Central Asian countries. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much.
uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of um, other countries and the influence of the elections uh, and the, the whole democratic process that we were discussing, um, is there um, an effect of the, the Mr. Tokayev's election? Is there is there going to be an effect of these reforms inside Karak that are happening inside Kazakhstan, the whole region? Mm -hmm. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Akilbaev. Yeah. Well, I believe that uh, even if you take the European Union example, where uh, you're not living in a vacuum, mm -hmm. certainly the states uh, which are uh, uh, neighboring countries, they are affecting your policies, whether it's economic policies, whether it's domestic political reforms, etc. So you are learning from each other, and I think it's uh, a good opportunity to certainly upgrade your standards, whether it's business standards, whether it's the political standards uh, on transparency and the gradual kind of effective democracy, I think. Because uh, it's uh, always about implementation. Uh, political reforms are in itself are very uh, transformative in Kazakhstan, I mean, on the paper. Certainly there is uh, intention and the demand and expectation from society. But it's also important for, uh, to uh, uh, closely monitor and uh, look at the implementation process, which is the most important mm -hmm. point in all these political reforms. So I, I think it's, uh, uh, there is a hope and then there is intention from the government side and the intention and expectations from the society. And uh, hopefully uh, I hope <coughs> that uh, the implementation process is going to be better. Thank you very much. Mr. a talk around, um, if you have a, a few words on the, the impacts of the Kazakh elections on the more a global Central Asian scene? Yes, I think uh, in many senses Kazakhstan is, is a pioneer when it comes to political reforms in the region in terms of involving, involving segments of the population which were not active, that active in politics, be it women and young people. Uh, and also in terms of limiting the presidential mandate, which you which you mentioned. And I think Uzbekistan also is, is looking very careful. They too are planning uh, a referendum uh, to their constitution, which was planned for this year, but probably because of the events in Karakal, Pakistan pushed uh, to next year. So we'll be paying very close attention to uh, to this, to how uh, Uzbekistan moves uh, next year. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Do we have uh, the translation back? Still not. Well, perfect. <laughs> okay. Hmm? Yes, okay. well, that's great. Um, okay, well, do you um, I have a question for you, Mr. Mr. Dietma? Um, <coughs> that with, um, of course, you know, working for the European Parliament, I'm very well aware of that, but um, with Kazakhstan going on a maybe more um, diplomatic, uh, not diplomatic, uh, democratic path, um, is there a possibility that there are going to be better relations with the European Parliament and therefore maybe less um, criticism toward the country? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, any, let's say, uh, credible, successful uh, democratization process, uh, political reform process, uh, will have a very positive effect on, on relations with the European Union. <laughs> Uh, um, certainly, you mentioned the European Parliament. I mean, the Parliament is very uh, closely following the situation there in Kazakhstan. Um, there have been different uh, resolutions, discussions, uh, and um, I think really it is in Kazakhstan's interest to um, to to make those uh, reforms and the whole process uh, to make it a, a credible one. I, yeah. I do believe, and it would also include. Um, a, um, let's say, uh, uh, making the investigation into the January events um, a, um, a, a, a really a priority also, and uh, also uh, we would expect <coughs> the, um, the, the, the results uh, of, of, of such an investigation would be shared also with the international community, uh, so to, that there is a certain transparency in this process. I think it's part of the whole, uh, um, it, it's part of the process, of the reform process, because in the end, I mean, the, the reform process is also, as it has been mentioned, it's, um, it's a response to the political, social, and economic grievances that became so apparent uh, through the January events. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, Mr. Kabayev, I saw you were nodding. Uh, do you have... A Anything on the, on maybe on the, on the well, uh, I agree that the, the social economic grievances are there and it has been openly stated that we need to deal with them and not uh, in a kind of a situational context that we expect to 
uh, if we are planning to improve our political institutions, we need to make them effective, not just uh, kind of uh, declaring the reforms. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I think with a stronger political institution, the system should be sustainable itself. And mm -hmm. why it's important? Because if you see the external uh, shocks which, is hap which are happening, it's in the interest of Kazakh Kazakhstan as a country to have a sustainable and strong and specifically effective political institutions and economic institutions, how to have a st strategic immune system towards that shocks. And that's why through this uh, structural and uh, effective reforms, uh, you can make it much more sustainable and effective. So it's uh, in the interest of the country to make the system much more balanced. Thank you very much. I think the translation is back for our Russian-speaking friends, it's great. No. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask um, Sir Andre about his um, take on the, um, the hopes of reforms that um, the new um, president, the new Takayev mandate is gonna bring. На самом деле уже хорошо то, что реформы идут с 2019 года я лично участвовал и участвую в процессе их разработки. Сначала в качестве члена Национального совета общественного доверия, сейчас как член Национального Курултая, и просто так, как активный гражданин, политический аналитик Казахстана. А с 2019 по 2021 год принято 22 из 29 мер в рамках четырех инициатив. В этом году проведена дважды конституционная реформа, и поэтому уже есть серьезная основа для продолжения этих реформ. Спасибо. На сегодняшний день... Сейчас... Дайте перевод. So what I can say is that for now, uh, the fact that the reforms have been launched since 2019, it's already um, a very positive thing. Uh, myself, I was involved in the development of the uh, of these reforms, and I represented the uh, national coral in framework of these discussions. And since 2019 up until 2021, uh, 22 out of 29 reforms in the framework of the four initiatives have been uh, implemented. And obviously these, uh, this year we saw uh, twice a uh, constitutional reform and this represents a uh, solid foundation for the future. То есть я хотел закончить, что уже создана основа для дальнейшего реформирования, серьезная основа. So basically what I wanted to say is that we build the foundations for a uh, prosperous future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Siddiq, uh, uh, Mukhi Tardagir. Mukhi Tardagir. Yes, sir, Mukhi Tardagir. Your, uh, your take maybe on the, on the reforms going on in, in Kazakhstan and the hopes. Please repeat it, your question. Um, what are the, your, your take on um, the reforms going on in Kazakhstan, what it can mean for the country, what we can expect uh, from President Tokayev's current term. Okay. Ну, э, во-первых, по реформам Токаева одна из важнейших <coughs> это то, что президент э, теперь следующие семь лет это его э, второй, по сути, но завершающий срок, потому что именно им, им самим были инициированы эти реформы о том, что вот следующий семилетний срок в Конституции. То есть каждый последующий президент будет иметь только один срок, 7 лет для реализации всех своих планов во внутренней и внешней политике. Это в Конституцию вошло, и мы теперь будем ожидать, как и надеемся, что за 7 лет все те, весь тот пакет реформ во внутренней, во внутренней политике, прежде всего, да, в реформировании институтов власти, в реформировании экономики, формирование так называемого бренда нового Казахстана, как все это будет реализовываться, потому что 7 лет это достаточный срок. Indeed, which is very important for, uh, for the, uh, the reforms that have been launched by Mr. Takayev is that in the, in the next uh, seven years uh, he will have a mandate during which he will uh, do his best to implement these reforms and we can also say that this is basically his second mandate and uh, his last. So uh, what he meant by that is that in the future any other president will have only seven years in order to implement the um, political agenda, be it on a national level or on international. And we hope that all the package of the reforms that have been presented by Mr. Tokayev will have a positive effect and we will see how this will um, 
um, influence positively the, eco uh, the economy and also uh, we hope that he will be able to implement the uh, new brand of Kazakhstan as he put it. Thank you. Поэтому uh, 7 лет это фактически uh, европейский или американский два срока по 4. Поэтому учитывая, что до этого было 3 года uh, работы в качестве президента, теперь согласно вот, uh, проведенным выборам Токаев получил uh, поддержку населения, то следующие 7 лет uh, uh, это тот срок и следующие президенты согласно конституции будут править только один срок. То есть сейчас он показал пределы э, властвования каждого последующего президента. Ну, в случае, если конституция наша с ее изменениями станет стабильной. We could talk about the equivalent of two mandates, so two multiplied by four years uh, in the US or uh, in the European Union. And you know, he has been a president for the previous three years. Now he has additional seven years to be able to uh, implement reforms thanks to the uh, support he received from the, the population and <coughs> in accordance with, um, with, with, uh, with the constitution that has been amended, uh, he basically put the limits for the future mandates of any other uh, president uh, that will uh, um, that will be elected in Kazakhstan in the future. И во внешней политике я хотел бы добавить, что очень важно, чтобы Токаев закончил ту кооперацию. Я не говорю интеграцию пока, да, но ту осторожную кооперацию, которая сейчас есть в Центральной Азии. Как известно, пять из четырех президентов Центральной Азии уже сменились, да. Более того, в Туркменистане один из молодых лидеров вообще в мире, топ-10 самых молодых лидеров президентов, в Узбекистане сменился президент, в Казахстане сменился президент, в Кыргызстане. Поэтому нас, мы, к примеру, ожидаем, что Центральная Азия станет субъектным регионом, и кооперация сейчас, вот та, которая началась, она, на нее был социально-политический заказ в элитах среди Центральной Азии. I would like to underline the importance of the external policy that, um, that we will see in the, in the future years. Uh, we're expecting uh, uh, President Tokayev to finalize the, um, uh, the cooperation of in, in, in Central Asia. So we don't speak about the integration yet, we speak about the uh, cooperation, as you know, four or five presidents of the, uh, uh, of the countries in Central Asia um, um, were replaced. So we have um, one of the youngest uh, presidents in Turkmenistan, also, we have a new president in Uzbekistan, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, and we hope that uh, Central Asia will, uh, will become a very important item in the agenda, the world and international agenda, and we hope that this will answer to the needs that have been uh, uh, presented and um, requested by the, uh, the elite. Thank you. Um, that, that was actually a very interesting point, um, saying that you were the first country in Central Asia to actually implement a seven-year uh, non-renewable term. Uh, Mr. Tokstra, um, how do you have any idea how it is perceived by the other Central Asian um, Central Asian countries? Could it set a precedent um, this seven years mandate in, in a region where presidents tend to serve rather long terms? Exactly, with the notable exception of uh, the Kyrgyz Republic, probably. But I don't see this being replicated in, for instance, uh, Turkmenistan or Tajikistan. But Uzbekistan, I think uh, this is the direction that uh, they're, they're planning uh, to take. Uh, and also another inno innovative uh, aspect is that uh, well, for many years, uh, reforms in Kazakhstan were carried out under the slogan economy first and, and politics later. And now, under President Tokayev, we see that the further economic development uh, reforms are not possible uh, unless uh, there is also a gradual uh, political modernization uh, and I think this uh, we will see uh, uh, replicated uh, or at moved uh, in this direction by other countries. And let me give you an example. Uh, last year, Kazakhstan became the first uh, country in the region to directly elect mayors of villages and rural districts. And uh, in the medium term, we, we also expect that uh, there will be direct election of, of governors, for instance. So I think this is the, the, the trend, <coughs> this is the standard. But I don't expect uh, unanimous replication by all the five uh, Central Asian countries. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Akubayev. Uh, if you have a thought on uh, how uh, these um, one-term presidents, a presidency can be perceived by the neighbors of Kazakhstan. Um. Well, uh, for, long for a long time, uh, the Central Asian countries had, uh, after the 
uh, disintegration of Soviet Union, they had a different political and economic models in general sense. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, it can be perceived as one of those kind of different models where Kazakhstan is stepping outside of this kind of traditional perception of uh, power uh, transition. So at some point, yes, it can be positively replicated at some point, maybe selectively. I'm not talking about the whole approach. Uh, at the same time, the, each country has its own p approach and vision how the country should go forward. We are not in capacity of uh, kind of setting an example or setting a trend. But uh, as we are living in the same region and as we try to kind of build a new economy, for example, not as a single state, but as a regional uh, cooperation, we, I believe that uh, by improving the political and economic standards will certainly set an example or give a, a positive uh, signals for uh, European partners or partners from the uh, kind of West in general sense or Asia, since is, if we would like to progress collectively, we had to improve or set a common ground for our partners to invest and cooperate with us. So it's uh, certainly up to the neighboring countries, but we certainly can give uh, some kind of uh, positive uh, patterns and uh, uh, write down the kind of alternative path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, one of the one of these very positive signals that we were we were talking about was the uh, the fact that parliamentary elections are going to be held um, at the, in the first half of 2023 in Kazakhstan, and maybe I would like to ask uh, Mr. Andre to, to explain um, to a very briefly for our audience what are the main political forces that are present in Kazakhstan today. Um, and that, that are going to fight within the, within the frame of the parliamentary elections. If you could explain to us how, how it works in Kazakhstan, please. У нас на сегодняшний день пять политических партий, которые официально зарегистрированы Министерством юстиции. Five political parties that have been registered by the Ministry of Justice. И еще около 20 инициатив по созданию новых политических партий. А причем большинство из них это политическая оппозиция. А есть партия Аманат, которая была когда-то партией Нуратан, партия власти. Сейчас она трансформируется в свое новое качество, когда уже действующий президент не является лидером партии, а Акимы регионов не возглавляет филиал этой партии. There is also the party called Manat, which used to be called Narat. So the uh, um, the president is no longer the uh, um, the head of uh, of this party, and the uh, the mayor no longer represent the local departments of this uh, precise party. И этой партии для того, чтобы сохранить позицию парламентского большинства, как сейчас, ей предстоит реально провести свое новое позиционирование. И новые использовать новые, скажем так, методы работы с, с, с избирателями. In order to keep the parliamentary majority uh, it has currently, the party will be forced to review its position and also to uh, tackle new methods of governing. У нас есть социал-демократы, это тоже оппозиционная партия, но, uh, как показала президентская избирательная кампания, очень слабо они используют новые методы работы с населением, они пока не провели свой ребрендинг. Есть еще партия АУИЛ, село, ориентирована на работу с сельчанами, но вот их кандидат, который участвовал в президентских выборах, Дайрабаев, в принципе, они показали, что они готовы работать с этой категорией избирателей. We have also the Social Democrats that represent the, uh, the opposition. However, the previous uh, presidential campaign, the elections showed that they're not, uh, they're not ready yet to, uh, to implement these new methods. They are not ready to rebrand the party. There is also another party called Awil, which represents namely the, the small towns. Uh, and its leader, uh, Darabayev, showed that um, he's ready to, uh, to work with, um, with this layer of, um, of our society. Две партии парламентской оппозиции – это Акжол, Светлый Путь, и Народная партия, бывшая коммунистическая. Они сейчас поддерживали, поддержали на выборах 
кандидатуру главы государства Касым Жамарда Такаева, но на выборах Мажелис парламента и Маслихата они, конечно, будут бороться между собой с остальными партиями. Regarding the two other uh, parties representing the opposition, Akjol and the, uh, uh, the Communist Party, they showed the support for, uh, for Tokayev during the, uh, the previous uh, presidential elections. However, during the next uh, parliamentary elections in the, in the next year, they will obviously compete against the, uh, the current uh, governing party. В сентябре этого года прошел съезд, учредительный съезд партии «Зеленых». Еще несколько партий обратились в Министерство юстиции с просьбой провести регистрацию. И мы надеемся, что две-три партии новых появятся вот к, новым, к ожидаемым парламентским выборам. Они тоже смогут принять участие. This year, uh, the Congress of the, uh, the Green Party uh, was, uh, was held and also uh, several requests uh, have been lodged at the, the Ministry of Justice in order to create new parties. And we hope that we will have two to three new uh, political parties that will be able to participate in the following uh, parliamentary elections. Но самое главное, что у нас вернули мажоритарную избирательную систему. И теперь большое количество граждан, это лидеры мнений, это гражданские активисты, они смогут проявить себя посредством самовыдвижения в деп... кандидатами в депутаты парламента, что очень придаст будущим выборам серьезный такой, скажем так, активный характер. Also, uh, an important thing is that we, we see the new, uh, the new mechanism, the new system of, uh, of election, that, um, electoral system that we, we used to have before, namely the, the activists uh, will, will be able to put forward their uh, the candidature and uh, will be able to switch to an, uh, an active approach in politics. Thank you very much. Um, given the promises made by President Takayev um, in terms of democratic reforms, how much of a, um, I'm going to address this question maybe to Mr. Tokstra, uh, how much of a democratic counterweight um, the, the parliament, the new parliament is actually going to be um, to counter the presidential executive power? Yeah, well, after the, the elections on 20th of November, we heard uh, President Tokayev say that uh, before the start of the parliamentary elections, several parties will be able uh, to fulfill the proper conditions and get registered. So he's, he has gone on record. Um, of course, um, we hope that uh, further loosening of requirements and excessive bureaucratic hurdles for the registration of new political parties will become a reality. Uh, we've seen, uh, 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 for instance, in Uzbekistan that lowering the threshold, for instance, of signatures required to create a new party has not actually led to uh, the registration of new parties. So we'll need to see and we will certainly come back uh, to this uh, question during the, the electoral cycle. But it's not a guarantee that it will function. Thank you very much. Um, I have now some questions from the audience. Um, I have a question from Mrs. Lepina asking, Mr. Chibutarev mentioned the January events, which cannot be ignored within the election results. Um, could we receive some comments of Mr. Chrysler uh, on this point? Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, it, it cannot be ignored. It's, um, it is there. Uh, it has not been... Um, uh, uh, completely uh, investigated. Uh, we we are really um, in all our contacts um, at different levels, but even at the highest political level, uh, we ask the Kazakh authorities uh, to um, also to to live up to that commitment that was made uh, to to investigate thoroughly, and um, as I said before, to share also the. Um, the results of that investigation in a very transparent way. But I do believe that um, it is important for the Kazakh society also to find a way to um, to relate to those events and, and those who have been um, become victim, and there have been many victims, uh, far too many, um, that they um, that uh, that they understand uh, that justice can be done uh, on 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 uh, on what happened uh, during those few days at the beginning of uh, January, 
I think for, for society it's very important to, to, to be confronted uh, with, uh, with the truth as uh, unpleasant also the truth might, uh, might be in the end. Uh, but it's very important. It's about the legitimacy of the state, about state authorities, the way they acted and reacted uh, in handling those events. And there are many, many uh, question marks still uh, where we also would like to, um, to, 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 get, uh, to get more elements of what, what really happened then. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have an answer from Ms. Go ahead. Позвольте прокомментировать этот момент. А у нас, по-моему, весной состоялись парламентские слушания, где выступали представители всех правоохранительных органов, Генеральной прокуратуры, Министерства внутренних дел, по-моему, Комитета национальной безопасности. Каждый из них представил на тот момент времени результаты тех расследований, которые были проведены. I would like to comment, if, uh, if I may, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, during spring uh, this year we, uh, we had a hearing, uh, the framework of which the prosecution's office, the Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs, the uh, um, National Security Commis uh, Committee, they all presented the, the results they had on the investigation carried out uh, uh, linked to the, uh, the events in January. И я надеюсь, что представители Министерства иностранных дел, они ознакомили всех внешнеполитических партнеров с результатами того, что было это изложено тогда. Ну и плюс, конечно, все это было опубликовано, это было озвучено и транслировано и по телевидению, есть и в онлайн-изданиях, на сайте Мажелиса парламента, это тоже трансляция была, то есть все это открыто. И поэтому вот наши партнеры, коллеги зарубежные могут всегда с этим ознакомиться. А тут надо еще иметь... Ввиду, что январские события – это очень сложный такой был процесс, когда, если проводить расследование, то по нескольким линиям. Была попытка государства, совершения государственного переворота, по этому поводу привлечены к ответственности бывший председатель Комитета национальной безопасности Карим Масимов, бывший министр обороны Бектанов. Это одна линия. I hope that the Minister of Foreign Affairs um, um, disseminated all this information, the results of the um, uh, of the invest investigation to our partners. And also, if you if you check the uh, online uh, uh, sources, you could see that th the results of the, uh, the investigation have been published online. Also, um, they have been shared on TV. And if you look at the websites of the of our parliament, you would see that there are also some some information, some results of the investigations published on the on the website. And um, also, you need to understand that the uh, um, the events in January were quite a difficult process. Uh, if we launch, if we look at the investigation, we should tackle several lines of the investigation because we also um, witnessed a coup d'état. And for instance, the uh, um, um, the ex uh, head of the uh, uh, of National Security Committee, Masimov, uh, and also the. Uh, the um, um, the ex uh, minister of, of defense Bektanov, they uh, they all they both have been heard in the framework of the uh, of this investigation. This is one line. Превышение служебного положения представителями силовых структур и применение пыток это вторая линия, по которой тоже проводилось и проводится расследование. Use of uh, extreme force and torture against the uh, uh, the protesters. That's another line of the investigation. Третья линия – это призывы и реальное проведение массовых беспорядков. Это не гражданский протест, это массовые беспорядки, которые носили противозаконный характер. The third line of the investigation is are the, the, the calls for massive disturbances. These are not civil protests. So this is чтобы, another line. Чтобы было понимание, Протесты начались в Мангистауской области по поводу повышения цен на газ. И, насколько я знаю, ни одного из участников этих протестов, которые действительно прошли буквально в течение двух дней и завершились мирно, никого не привлекли к ответственности. 
as far as I know, the, uh, the process uh, started in the region of Pakistan where uh, people protested against the rise of prices of, uh, of gas. Uh, however, as far as I know, uh, during the first two days of peaceful uh, protests, no uh, uh, pro protesters were, uh, were arrested. И четвертая линия – это совершение э, обычных уголовных преступлений во время, скажем так, периода безвластия. Особенно это наблюдалось в городе Алматы, когда действительно ходили вооруженные люди, не было полиции, и просто грабили магазины, ломбарды, банки и так далее. Then the fourth line of uh, investigation are the criminal offences that have been committed during, uh, during the process, uh, during the, uh, the period of lack of um, police forces, for instance. Uh, especially uh, we witnessed the situation in Astana, where armed people, given the fact that police uh, wasn't um, in certain uh, neighbourhoods, they were robbing, um, robbing shops, uh, banks and so on. Когда мы говорим о необходимости проведения расследования, надо понять, что невозможно с юридической точки зрения объединить все эти дела в одно. Поэтому вот четыре линии основные, а силовики, может быть, выдвигают свои какие-то еще дополнительные линии. This is why when we speak about an investigation as a whole, uh, it is impossible to uh, put all these, these lines together into one uh, element from a legal uh, point of view. This is why we need to speak about all these lines and obviously the uh, uh, certain representatives of, uh, um, uh, of police or other uh, departments have their own version of what happened. Thank, thank you very much uh, for this very thorough um, um, Adding to the question, I have another question I would like to ask to Mr. Akilbaev um, from Sabina. Are Kazakhstani elites on the same page with the government regarding economic reforms, um, namely the ones related to the demonopolization of economy? Well, um, if we mean elites uh, from the political sense or from economic sense, from, uh, as I guess uh, maybe she implied, uh, Sabina implied, uh, elites from the the biggest uh, sectors of the Kazakh economy, or the so-called oligarchs, or etc. Yes. So basically, um, uh, President Tokayev has gathered several times and met with uh, leading uh, people from the business sector uh, and energy sector, who are maybe uh, managing those assets, uh, which are quite linked to the, the national economy. So I believe at this stage, uh, I think they uh, should be should be on the same page because uh, just recently during this uh, inauguration process we saw several faces and numbers of people f representing uh, those sectors uh, and leading those sectors. Mm -hmm. And at this stage certainly uh, they should at least uh, uh, kind of move forward uh, and uh, kind of uh, improve the distribution of wealth uh, to the people of Kazakhstan. And the, 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 the special fund, uh, fund was established after the January events. Uh, the, the, the issue is how we are going to uh, implement those economic reforms and what is, will their role in that process. It's uh, kind of certainly under the question. Um, but I think at this stage they, they should understand that uh, they are part of the kind of so-called just Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. uh, but in reality, uh, the implementation process is, will require them to be more objective in their decisions. Thank you very much for the thorough answer. And I have another question for Mr. Chrysler uh, from Raymond Koenig. Um, um, Kazakhstan becomes increasingly important, and you said it, and it's been it's been emphasized by several of our of our colleagues here. Uh, increasingly important for the EU, following on the connectivity summit and considering China's interest in the region, so the Belt and Road Initiative. What actions can be expected from the EU to increase uh, its influence in the region? Well, if we talk about um, connectivity uh, specifically, um, uh, as I had said, we have um, discussed that with our Central Asian partners. We discussed it also bilaterally with them. Uh, we try to understand better what their needs are in terms of connectivity. They don't have, they don't have all the same needs, uh, obviously. Uh, due to their uh, economic um, structures, due to their um, geopolitical uh, and economic uh, locations. 
um, and so on. So we look, we look thoroughly what, what, what is it that they need, but what, what is it also what they want from the European Union as a region. Uh, we want them to um, ideally to speak with one voice. Um, to us, um, um, and we, we say that because we, the European Union has been going through a very long um, integration process and we do believe we have a few lessons learned uh, to offer also to Central Asia. Um, uh, at the same time, of course, recognizing that uh, those countries are different and uh, that they're also um, different uh, in terms of their regional economic and political process, it cannot be it cannot be the same like it was in uh, in Europe, um, but we can offer um, we can offer uh, uh, expertise. We can offer uh, ideas. We can offer, uh, uh, of course, also um, funding, concrete funding for for projects. Uh, there is a a global strategy uh, which is called Global Gateway uh, that the EU has launched last uh, December. And um, we very much like uh, Central Asia to, to become a, a partner in that global gateway strategy um, because I think uh, it has a lot to offer to Central Asia. Um, uh, investment, uh, as I said, expertise, uh, but also concrete uh, uh, programs and projects that can be developed together. And so um, from, from these, so the global gateway and all these expertise, as you said, investments, um, given the interest that you said the EU is clearly having in, into developing ties with the, with Kazakhstan, um, has the EU approach become maybe more pragmatic than it was before towards um, Central Asian countries, and namely Kazakhstan? It has become more strategic um, because uh, we we live in a polarizing world uh, since February, um, and uh, it's very important to see what uh, value uh, strategic relations with um, regions or countries outside the EU can, can actually bring. Um, and this is not a, a unilateral uh, a way of looking at it, I, I believe. It's, uh, it's both ways. And I do believe that a region like uh, Central Asia has, a, has, a, has an interest, really, uh, perhaps even also a strategic interest, to, um, to, to cooperate closer with the European Union, uh, to engage in more dialogue, um, to e expand uh, uh, relations and areas of cooperation. Um, and in that respect, uh, the EU has, has a lot to offer um, to, to, to Central Asia. And I, I really think that um, for a region that is um, traditionally and historically dependent uh, on uh, on one one big player, perhaps mm -hmm. two big players, mm -hmm. uh, it is not a bad uh, situation to find itself uh, also having another uh, region, an, 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 another uh, block of countries um, uh, that is interested in developing uh, relations with them. Okay, thank you very much. I think Mr. Mukhit <coughs> Ardagerov wanted to add something. Mm -hmm. Да, я хотел бы сказать, что вот господин Кристос сказал о том, что мы готовы помочь Центральной Азии опытом европейской интеграции, так как опыт у Европы большой. I give time for, for the trans translate. I would like to, to come back to what Mr. Chrysler said. Uh, he talked about some help uh, that could be provided to, to Kazakhstan, namely its rich experience and the integration they had. Ну, я сам специализируюсь на Европе в Центральной Азии. Я выпустил первый глоссарий Европейского Союза 10 лет назад. Поэтому историю Европы и европейской интеграции знаю очень хорошо. I am one of the, uh, the main specialists uh, of Europe from Kazakhstan, and I published one of, uh, actually, the first glossary on the European Union 10 years ago, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with the, with the topic. Я хочу сказать, что uh, если мы будем сравнивать Европейский Союз и Центральную Азию, то Европейский Союз преодолел гораздо больше противоречий этой подвижной границы, этой взаимной претензии, этой водные вопросы, этой исторические друг друга претензии. Он смог все преодолеть. Если мы возьмем Центральную Азию, uh, про, uh, предпосылок для интеграции гораздо больше, потому что там нет взаимных, к примеру, территориальной претензии, там нет каких-то в прошлом вооруженных конфликтов народов Центральной Азии. Но, ладно, переводчик. 
And if, if we compare European Union to the, uh, the Central Asia, well, I could say that European Union had more constraints, uh, maritime matters, historical matters, territorial claims, also armed conflicts in the, in the past. However, here in Central Asia, we, we didn't have this, namely, um, armed conflicts. We, we didn't have that compared to European Union. No, вместе с тем, господин Кристер сказал, что чем мы можем быть полезны Центральной Азии? Дело в том, что одна из крупнейших ошибочных точек зрения на Центральную Азию, в которой, кстати, вы все сейчас об этом говорили, что вы рассматриваете Центральную Азию как регион между Китаем и Россией, между Китаем и Европой. Даже в своих словах вы отказываете субъектности этому региону. Это как во время плана Маршала США рассматривали Европейский Союз как регион между США и Россией. И это до сих пор ошибка в вашем дискурсе, она есть. То есть на уровне даже дискурса есть отказ субъектности Центральной Азии. And Mr. Christopher talked about the, uh, the, the useful help that could be provided to, uh, to Kazakhstan, to Central Asia. But I would like to underline the importance of a uh, mistake that you, uh, you commit in, in, your, in your speech. Uh, um, overall, um, you consider Central Asia as a uh, region between Russia and China, or China and the United States. And, um, we uh, also seen this mistake during the implementation of the Marshall Plan, um, when when Europe has been uh, was considered as a uh, intermediary region, so to speak, between the U.S. and Russia. И uh, между тем, как исследователь европейской картографии, я хочу сказать, что первые карты всех государств Центральной Азии были написаны европейскими картографами в 1544 году. Я вот перечислю. Первую карту казахского государства нарисовал немец Себастьян Мюнцер. Первую карту казахского государства в 1562 году нарисовал бельгиец Герард Меркатор. Затем написал ее нидерландец Фредерик Дэвид. Сейчас минутку. Затем написал ее француз Жак Нолин. То есть контакты, если мы будем сравнивать, 15-16 века между Европой и непосредственно Центральной Азией гораздо глубже, чем контакты между Центральной Азией и Европейским Союзом сейчас. Хотя сейчас есть логистика, самолеты, интернет и так далее. Myself as a researcher, I could say that the first map uh, of Central Asia has been uh, created by the cartographers in, uh, in 1544, so the 16th century. And the first map uh, of Kazakhstan had been um, uh, created and uh, written by the, uh, uh, the German uh, Sebastian uh, Mütter and then by the, uh, has been amended by the Belgian uh, citizen Mercator, then the, Dutch, um, the Dutchman Dav uh, David uh, also amended it, and finally the, uh, uh, the French uh, Nolan. So if we look at the situation at the, uh, um, um, at the, um, the links that Central Asia had with the European Union during the 15th, the 16th uh, centuries, uh, they were more active, more solid than the uh, links we see, we currently see between uh, Europe and, and Kazakhstan or Central Asia. Я говорю, с точки зрения придания субъектности государствам Центральной Азии, учета этого, нужно рассматривать Центральную Азию не как между вот этим регионом, а как субъектный регион, который сейчас идет осторожно, если не к интеграции, то к кооперации. Вот в чем европейская помощь именно в этом направлении, она действительно нуждается, Центральная Азия и государство. So when you speak about the, uh, the support that you could provide uh, to the Central Asia, to Kazakhstan, uh, we, see, we would like you to, 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 to look at us, to see us as a separate region as a whole and not an intermediary uh, region between two other uh, big regions or countries. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, insight. Thing is, this is almost all the time we have for. However, um, so first I'd like to thank our panel and thanks, of course, to our audience for their questions. Before we wrap up the session, I will. Before we wrap up the session, I would like um, to ask you to do maybe a final statement, one minute max. Excuse me, but I have my speech <laughs> concerning Central Asia situation, in Central Asia in modern, in, in contemporary uh, with. For example, European Union. Hmm? Well, thank you. Um, I have time. I have time. Uh, don't think. Minutes? I don't think so. No, no, one minute each, and uh, for our final uh, statement. Uh -huh. Each of you, Mr. Kisler, if you want to start. Um, I would say uh, Central Asia and Kazakhstan they matter for the European Union, um, but it's not a one-way um, relationship. Uh, it's it's two ways. Uh, the EU has a lot to offer uh, to Central Asia. Um, 
and it's uh, I think the EU has um, has uh, is is a, is an honest player in this regard in this relationship. I think this is, would be my main message. Uh, the the uh, the Central Asians have also a lot to offer to the European Union. Uh, not least uh, when we talk about uh, green energy, uh, climate change, uh, we have not uh, elaborated on those issues here. But uh, but Central Asia would be uh, uh, really uh, encouraged to, to to join the European Union in 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 fighting the effects of of climate change. And those effects are actually in that region of Central Asia are, are so um, are having such a negative impact on. On, on livelihoods that um, I think here we are um, close, close allies, should be close allies. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the 2022 has been, was, as we mentioned, the year of unprecedented changes, uh, geopolitical turbulence, and we see that the competition between big powers is gaining a higher pace. Uh, the war in Ukraine certainly has changed the perception of world affairs, and we uh, still do not know how it's going to end and what's going to be uh, uh, in that place. But when we speak about European Union and Central Asia, I see a, a great potential where we uh, can, on bilateral and mutual uh, level, can uh, learn different practices and best practices in this respect. And I believe that the, if you look at the economy, uh, human capital, education, uh, climate change, energy sector, they're all uh, sectors and areas of great potential. And, but we need to use that in a good way and constructive way. Thank you very much. Talkstra? Yes, uh, first, uh, a word on connectivity. I think it's, uh, it's important to look not only at the uh, hard uh, connectivity at the roads, at the railways, but also at the soft connectivity, at the harmonization of rules and regulations. And I think here is where the EU really has an added value in the region. And also the EU, I don't think it sees Central Asia just as a region of transit, but uh, as a region where the local population derives benefits from all these transit corridors, transportation corridors. And I think this will be the subject of the EB the study that was mentioned. And then uh, a comment on President Tokayev. I think he's uh, emerged uh, stronger uh, from this very tumultuous year. I think the approval rate uh, shows just this by the uh, independent Central Asia barometer and others. Uh, he managed to remove uh, members of the old elite that did not share his reformist credentials, so he has now a uh, very strong mandate to implement uh, the reforms for a new, a fair and an inclusive Kazakhstan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chibotarev. Your final. А сильной стороной Европейского Союза является наличие отдельной стратегии относительно Центральноазиатского региона, которая уже второй раз принимается ЕС. Это вот первая была в 2007-го, потом это вот 2019-го года стратегия действующего. Есть специальный представитель Европейского Союза в Центральной Азии. The advantage of the European Union is that you have a separate strategy for, for our region, for the region of Central Asia, and you, uh, you've adopted two strategies, um, the first one in 2008 and the second in 2019. There is also, there's also a special representative of the European Union in our region. Но есть немало слабых сторон уже по реализации этой стратегии. Первое это то, что много направлений этой реализации по образованию, экономике, социальной сфере, культурной, безопасности, но нет какой-то единой четкой координации. However, there are uh, a couple of drawbacks uh, in the implementation of, this, uh, of these strategies. Um, namely, we, we see a lack of um, coordination <coughs> between uh, several directions of this, uh, so several activities of uh, this strategy. So there's the uh, economic, the social, the security, the culture um, um, directions of, the, um, uh, of this strategy, but there's no uh, coordination. A второй важный момент это то, что хотя Центральная Азия Это единый регион, но все пять стран, они и по политической, и по экономической линии развиваются по-разному. И поэтому здесь, когда нужно подходить к взаимоотношениям Евросоюз и Центральной Азии, это надо все учитывать. Так же, как надо и учитывать то, что все-таки у нас восточная, а это значит консервативная в определенной части общества. Особенно, когда от нас требовать какие-то вопросы там, относительно гендерного фактора, относительно фактора разных меньшинств и так далее. Нужно понимать, что 
не всегда власть, допустим, ограничивает что-то. Иногда само общество реагирует очень жестко и консервативно на решение каких-то вот этих вопросов. The second thing I would like to underline is the fact that despite this uh, united uh, uh, region of Central Asia that, uh, that we, we see, you should not forget that we have five countries, five countries that have different um, um, approaches for the development, be it social or economic. So you, you really need to take this into account, especially uh, given the fact that this, um, this is a conservative uh, society and um, especially when we talk about gender, minorities issues, uh, you should understand that it is not always the, uh, the authorities, the government that uh, slows down some, uh, uh, some matters. Uh, this society sometimes reacts aggressively to, to, to new, new elements in this culture. Thank you very much. Ну, самое главное, каким видится и всегда является Европейский Союз для Казахстана и Центральной Азии, это прежде всего ценности ценности, которые разделяют и в Казахстане. Они абсолютно нами принимаемы, они не, для нас не чужие и абсолютно ре, реализуемы. Это первое. First thing, uh, when we talk about the, uh, the difference between Kazakhstan, or the Central Asia and the European Union, we uh, could say that the values are the same in Kazakhstan. We share the in, here in, in, in Kazakhstan, we share your values. There are enough foreign uh, foreign values for us, so we are ready to implement them. И поэтому второе это вопросы демократической и технологической модернизации. И следующий важный вопрос, вот последняя стратегия по Центральной Азии была принята в 2019 году. После 2019 года произошла всемирная пандемия, идет военный конфликт в Украине, поэтому модернизация стратегии Центра... Европейского Союза к Центральной Азии даже 2019 года, она уже устарела. Соответственно, нужно Европейскому Союзу быть более динамичным, более мобильным в Центральной Азии. Это первое. И второе. First thing, uh, we talk about the democratic and technological developments in Central Asia and Kazakhstan, and uh, my colleague mentioned the second strategy adopted by the European Union in 2019. Uh, you know that after 2019 we had the pandemic, uh, also the armed conflict in Ukraine. So this strategic, uh, sorry, this strategy uh, adopted in 2019, it is already obsolete. So the European, the European Union needs to modernize it. It needs to be more dynamic and more. Um, um, Needs to be accelerated. И второй момент – это то, что в Центральной Азии идет уже кооперация, которая знаменует начало интеграции. Европейский Союз должен не пропустить этот момент, потому что ни одна проблема, с которой сталкивается Центральная Азия, не является эксклюзивной и нерешаемой. Такие же проблемы в свое время читала Вышеградская четверка, решала. Поэтому вот опыт Вышеграда по применению к Центральной Азии, учитывая 4 и 5 государств, да? ну, плюс еще там, возможно, Афганистан, наш соседний, я думаю, они абсолютно решаем. Поэтому кооперация Центральной Азии началась. А кооперация – это первая стадия да, интеграции. Как в свое время Европейский Союз начинался с объединения угля и стали, mm -hmm. то сейчас эта кооперация тоже у нас идет. Спасибо. Поэтому Европейскому Союзу надо быть более мобильным. Спасибо. Second um, aspect I would like to underline is the cooperation which represents the first uh, stage or the beginning of the integration. Um, here the European Union should, uh, should not ignore this step and follow, uh, follow it. Also we talk about the four or five um, countries in the region. We could also add to this list Afghanistan and we could also compare the situation to what happened uh, in, in the European Union uh, at, at its beginning when we uh, tried to, to unite uh, everyone um, under the auspices of uh, the coal and seal cooperation. Well, thank you, very, thank you very much. It was very interesting to hear all, all of your takes on this. I would really like to thank our panel here and the audience we had uh, in this room and online. Uh, it's the end of this uh, your active hybrid conference with the support of the Embassy of Republic of Kazakhstan in Belgium. Uh, I'm Charles Shumsky and thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you.